Dr. Vikram, um, who was going to be our first presenter, is um, stuck somewhere in the vicinity. So hopefully he'll make it in in time. Uh, but we're gonna have to to get a, a little a little creative, in uh, and and switch things um, around. Uh, so my name is Hania Dawood. I'm the practice manager for climate finance and economics at the the World Bank Group. So my team is actually actively involved uh, in the MDB Article Six Working Group, um, and you know in other engagements where we work closely with the MDBs on carbon markets, you know D4C, uh, and and others. So really pleased to be here today to moderate this um, this discussion. Now, goes without saying, you know, need for climate finance are, are massive. The this, this stat that I think is, is going around the top is three to six trillion dollars per annum until 2030. And the flows of finance uh, pale in comparison. Um, I think the revised uh, CPI methodology has the figures that a, a little over um, a, a little over a trillion, uh, but even even there, and too bad Vikram is not here. To maybe push back on me. Even that increase, you know, some people say is really mostly because of methodology changes as opposed to because of you know real increase in in climate um, finance. So. We need to unlock all sources of climate finance and results-based climate finance and, and carbon markets. Carbon finance is a potential source of, of finance. And if it's designed well, it could accelerate climate action. It could draw in resources for the transitions that wouldn't happen um, otherwise. And, you know, carbon carbon-based payments can be considered uh, a grant equivalent and a good complement to, to concessional resources. So that's why, you know, we at the World Bank are, are, are in this business for some time. That's why we work very closely with our colleagues in the in the MDBs to figure out how to unlock, how to really hash out the technicalities of Article 6, how to, you know, work with stakeholders in voluntary carbon markets to, to really get it right and get the, get the money to, to start um, uh, flowing. And of course, Article 6 is an important mechanism in, in this regard. And as, as MDBs, we each support our client countries uh, in a range of areas around capacity building for, for Article 6. And as an MDB community, we've been coming together as part of the Article 6 working group to exchange knowledge and, and harmonize approaches and really help contribute to the process of operationalizing Article 6. And, and how do we, you know, how do we do that? The MDB working group is uh, the secretariat of the Climate Market Club. The Climate Market Club is a group of about 20 entities, about 15 sovereigns and, and five non-sovereigns that come together to um, to analyze issues around Article 6, and, and we jointly submit proposals uh, with our inputs to UNFCCC. Um, and we also come together to provide joint inputs on you know, major initiatives like ICVCM and, and, and VCMI. And uh, today, I'm, I'm very pleased we'll be hearing from um, each of, of the MDBs represented here on how they are supporting countries with, with Article 6. And then fingers crossed Vikram will um, will arrive to, to give us his take on what's going on in, in climate finance and, and, and what, are, uh, what are the gaps. So in terms of the agenda, uh, we'll start with Hari. Oh, I think it's 4 a.m. For, for, for Hari. So thank you for joining us so early, who'll, um, who'll tell us about what, what uh, we're doing at the bank, what are some of the concerns that we're hearing from, from our uh, clients uh, on this topic. And then, you know, Gareth, uh, Jan Willem, and, and VK will give us a regional perspective on, on some of these, these issues. Um, then we'll move in and have a moderated discussion. And like I said, it's a small group, so we'll try to keep it uh, keep it informal. In uh, so without further ado, um, Hari, over to you. Thank you so much, Hania. Hope you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you well. Yeah, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. So if we can put my slides up. Be great. Uh, 
So slides up, I can't see. Uh, it is already. It's opening. Just give us okay. a couple of seconds. Okay, here you go. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thank you again for joining this MDP session. Uh, I'm going to talk about what the World Bank is doing uh, to support countries and market to participate uh, uh, through different efforts uh, that bring trust, transparency, and finance. Um, Honey, I talked a little bit already what the MDBs are jointly doing, uh, but I'm going to dive into a little bit into what the World Bank is doing. Next slide, please. Just to give a context, I'm sure many in the room know already, the World Bank has uh, been managing uh, the results-based and climate uh, funds since we launched the world's first uh, you know, carbon fund more than 20 years ago, the prototype carbon fund. Uh, again, this has been partnership uh, with many of the development partners we, we, we have here in the room. Uh, we led the groundwork for international carbon markets and the Kyoto Protocol and became a kind of a market maker in a way with the substantial funds uh, we have under our management and uh, we still oversee today. Uh, of the billions we managed, a significant portion, uh, around 1 billion uh, came from the private sector. And, uh, and then, as you see, we have also paid more than 220 million emission reductions in that time. But most importantly, uh, we have provided technical, critical investment and capacity building to you know, dozens of developing countries so that they can access the results based climate finance we're offering. And under the Paris Agreement, uh, we are all set to do again, uh, which is the culmination of these two decades of lessons learned uh, by working with our client countries in the carbon market space. Next slide. This uh, uh, gives an impression about how all banks support on carbon markets. And uh, you see, if you notice that it follows the entire value chain approach, uh, starting from conceptualizing new ideas uh, that forces the market requirement well in advance, sometimes of course five to 10 years well advanced, then market is ready. Uh, prototyping and testing those ideas, uh, uh, mostly with the World Bank country programs or with interested partners, and then scaling them up mainly through our country support initiatives. Uh, accordingly, if you see in, on the slides, the initiatives like the Fit Warehouse, uh, you know, the Common Market Club and Invest for Climate, these all support the conceptualization and prototyping, whereas the partnership for market implementation facility with the uh, uh, implementation and the scaling up. All of these help on you know, facilitating the enabling environment at the country and also for the global level uh, to participate in carbon markets. Then the final piece of the value chain is supporting monetization of carbon credits. And this is where facilities like the scale comes in and the help monetizing through resource-based payments and six transactions. All of these are structured under you know, new climate investments and are intentionally designed to complement and amplify uh, our core offerings and also our other critical sectoral and climate focused resources so that we as an institution are providing a robust toolkit of climate options uh, and that our client countries uh, access. Next slide, please. Before I introduce details about the specific work that we are doing, uh, it is important to also understand the context in which we are operating at the moment. Now, you, you are all familiar with many things that are listed on the slide, despite the more than two decades of experience with carbon markets. So the market is currently facing many headwinds, uh, both on supply side and demand side. Again, on the private sector, which is where uh, the demand comes, uh, issues like greenwashing, how to identify quality, credits, how to develop a robust decarbonization plan that considers not different supporting mechanisms, including the use of carbon credits. Uh, all of these are slowing down the market activity. At the global level, again, uh, challenges with robust methodologies and supporting infrastructure like MRV, registry systems, country support systems and arrangements. So to provide uh, no clarity to buyers and the capacity of host countries to get you know, prepared for it or introducing different levels of uncertainty to market players. Next slide. I think this, I, I do not need to know uh, uh, overemphasize here, but I think you know, it's very clear from the you know, experience for the last couple of years where countries uh, are very proactive and advanced, especially with Article 6.2 you know, transactions, uh, 
know, they're still unable to make robust decisions and understanding the role of carbon markets to meet their NDC targets, you know, prioritization of sectors or, acti uh, you know, or activities uh, that are you know, eligible to participate, uh, what level of policy frameworks uh, one needs to introduce, and how do we actually provide a clear guidance to the market you know, that balances the interest of both countries and market players. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that countries are facing. Next slide. This, of course, summarizes what the World Bank is supporting. Uh, to you see through creating standards like FCPF, uh, new methodologies, uh, like we're at the early quality commissioning, country-driven standards, like standardized creating framework where the country owns the entire process and also issue the credits, and creating the assets from eligible uh, World Bank operations. In the market infrastructure side, you know, and the transparency integrity, we, as Hani also mentioned, we offer end-to-end -end open source, modular digital infrastructure, and helping countries mainly with the registries and the independent standards to connect, uh, uh, for example, with the, the Climate Action Data Trust that uh, uh, we launched jointly with the government of Singapore and IETA last year. On monetization, here are initiatives like you know, Transformative Carbon Asset Facility, TCAF, already helping monetizing credits you know, from innovative crediting approaches like recently signed uh, MC Reduction Purchase Agreement with Uzbekistan for, uh, for its energy reform agenda to remove subsidies and facility like scale uh, is aiming to support you know, transformative programs covering infrastructure, nature, and policy interventions. In addition to uh, all this, we are also helping countries uh, with structuring innovative business models around carbon revenue flows. Again, here uh, to quote uh, recently launched uh, emission reduction link bonds uh, in Vietnam for water purification carbon market transaction. Finally, uh, we are also working with more than 30 countries now, helping uh, on different elements, mainly enabling environment, ranging from strategic development, policies, framework, you know, and needs assessments, what are the processes and procedures that country needs to establish to build their capacity and, and uh, enhance their readiness to participate in carbon markets. Next slide. This is just to show, uh, again, the, the different components of the digital ecosystem that we are working and helping number of countries that I listed here. Um, and here it provides an enormous opportunity, especially the digital MRV uh, to you know, support increase the transparency, build trust and reduce transaction cost. Um, there is a, of course, a side event during this COP jointly with EBRD on December 3rd, where we showcase the, the work uh, on, on the digital MRV, how a digital MRV of a particular project you can directly connect to the registry and then where the issue is set up. And uh, so please uh, attend that one in case you know you wanted to find more details on, on the work that we are doing uh, on, on digital MRV space. Next slide. Now this again, uh, again, Hania also briefly touched upon the Climate Market Club, where we bring up for like minded countries uh, that are already engaged in Article 6 uh, activities, and it provides a transfer a platform to discuss you know, technical matters uh, to mainly operationalize Article 6. Uh, and uh, as you see, 14 countries and five organizations as non primary members. Uh, we also developed several what we call as approach papers on different technical elements. And of course, you can all access these papers on, on the Climate Warehouse website. Next slide. This is, of course, again, a new initiative from the bank. Uh, they do facilitate the dialogue between sellers and buyers and to understand the needs and the issues each face, uh, co develop potentially solutions that can help scale markets. We are launching what we call as Carbon Action Forum uh, during this COP. Uh, the government of Singapore anchors the forum and uh, World Bank uh, um, uh, convenes and then supports the forum. Uh, so there is a launch event on December 5th at 11 a.m. again at the World Bank Pavilion. So please attend uh, no, if you have to find more details uh, on this one as well. Uh, next, in my final slide. Finally, uh, well, for us, you know, partnerships are key. Uh, we work with several partners on different issues uh, that are mutually interesting and then so to enhance the impact. Uh, there are some examples uh, uh, of our partners at present. Um, so, of course, we can, we can, I can talk more about you know, each of these in case interested. Um, but I think uh, moving forward, we are stepping up our ambition uh, to scale high integrity, high impact markets. And we want to do this uh, with others. Uh, during this COP, uh, um, our president will announce the World Bank Carbon Markets Engagement Roadmap, which highlights carbon markets as a game changer and and then sets out the world bank uh, ambition uh, three elements how to support a uh, robust supply of high integrated credits how can we leverage large-scale bank supported programs 
and how we can ramp up efforts to you know, show up a sound and well-functioning and trusted capital markets. Thank you for your attention. I think I took a little more than seven minutes that is allocated, but hope this helped to understand a range of things that the bank is doing at present. Thanks so much for your attention again. Over to you, Hania. Thank you. Um, thanks, Hari. So maybe in, in some, you know, we've been uh, we've been in this space for a while. Uh, we're investing more in this space with the hope of, of unlocking um, capital that's hard. Capacity building in EMDs is, is is difficult. It's complicated in addition to the challenges in capacity building, as the slide that Hari um, put on from the infrastructure, there's national level MRV, there are registry systems, project level MRV. So a lot of you know a lot of different pieces to, to get right. And you know the approaches that that added, have truly added value were around convening, you know, convening stakeholders uh, in the climate market club and the digital for for climate. And you know, Hari referenced the carbon action forum that we will launch in a couple of days that's really focused on transaction level challenges. So if a buyer is trying to sell a credit and is really struggling with thinking through how, how to label the credit or not. So we're really trying to be practical. So to move away from the theoretical and 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 really learn from the the uh, approach of the climate market club that we've we've worked on very closely with our MDB colleagues. Um, so with this I'll pass on to um Gareth. Um, so if you can uh, project my slides, please. Um, I'm going to jump into Article 6, and in particular, Article 6.8. Uh, so, uh, and I'm going to try to focus on some of the opportunities and uh, what we could do to actually leverage some funding uh, around Article 6.8 and give you an example that we're working on at the African Development Bank called the uh, Adaptation Benefits Mechanism. So, um, Hania, in her introduction, um, talked a little bit about the, you know, the need to increase global climate finance. So just over one trillion now reported by CPI. Um, I, I used to have it in my slides and I often show it. I don't have it this time, but you may be familiar with the spaghetti diagram that they have about the, uh, you know, the, the, the flow of finance. And you'll know that there's that gray bit in the middle that shows that the vast majority of money goes to mitigation and a very small component goes to adaptation. And this is in uh, stark contrast to uh, the commitment that parties made in the Paris Agreement to try to level investments in adaptation and mitigation. And so I think that one way that we could very quickly make progress on increasing climate finance would be if developing, sorry, developed country parties would start to make good on their commitment to, uh, to balance that finance. Now, I think the main reason why they haven't done so is that there are a lack of instruments to apply uh, funding to adaptation in particular. Uh, and uh, that's what we're trying to develop with the adaptation benefits mechanism. So let me talk a little bit about Article 6.8, first of all. Uh, and um, first of all, let's start at, at, you know, basically what is a non-market approach? Well, of course, the easy answer, well, anything that's not a market approach, uh, but uh, that's not very informative. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can look at policies and, and levies and, and so on, things that don't, uh, uh, well, many different things, I think, that we could describe as non-market. But I think uh, there's more information or more detailed theme on the defini definition of a non-market approach from parties in uh, various submissions. And the main thing that came across was activities that do not result in the transfer of an asset from a developing country to developed country. So, um, and, and obviously you, that's what you see in carbon trading, where you have all these registries and all this complexity around how you transfer the units out. So if you don't do that, then it would be a non-market approach. Now, why is this interesting? Um, and uh, I think, I, actually, I, I mean, I used to work a lot on carbon trading, but I found Article 6.8 and non-market approaches now to be extremely um, attractive. And I think there's a lot of opportunities here that we need to become more aware of. First of all, um, the assets that you create, and assets uh, in inverted commas under a non-market approach, they don't need to be fungible. Uh, which means you can get away from this complexity around monitoring and reporting um, at such clearly defined units. And you don't need all this registry infrastructure that Harry showed you uh, to control uh, the transfer and so on, because you're not you're not creating assets that are going to be traded and that are for speculation and for uh, for for trading and transfer. You're just creating units or, or, or we call them adaptation benefits that are going to be surrendered as evidence of your contribution towards a non-market approach, in our case, uh, uh, towards adaptation. 
Secondly, the um, uh, one of the things that we see in the carbon markets is this concept of accrediting period, uh, which is the length of time that carbon projects are able to generate uh, emission reductions. And actually, this is a completely arbitrary figure. Um, and it creates huge value for project developers and, and they, it incentivizes them to find projects that pay off very quickly. And then you get a long tail of you know, effectively free revenues just from continuing to generate um, um, emission reductions for sales of the market. And, and Hania, you, you referred to the grant equivalency uh, of, these, uh, of this kind of approach in the carbon markets. I'm not sure that it is grant equivalency, but I don't know enough about it to, to know for sure. Um, but uh, what I do see is that carbon projects take up a lot of money uh, and, and they continues going and it comes to the project developer, which is very nice. It's profit making for the project developer, but it's not a good use of scarce climate finance. If you apply it under a non-market approach where you don't have a crediting period, but instead you have a, a length of time where you generate revenues long enough to enable the project to become sustainable, then you do much less finance. And I, we've done some studies to look at comparing, for example, an afforestation project from a carbon point of view and, a, and an adaptation non-market based approach. And it's much more efficient. It's a much more efficient use of climate finance to use it for the project and then stop paying that project once it's completed its task. Uh, and the third point is that um, if you can develop uh, adaptation projects or, or non-market approaches that don't result in a transfer of mitigation units out of the host country, then you help the host country meet their, their targets. You help them raise ambition, which of course is something that we want to do. But why don't we see more about Article 6.8? Uh, well, First of all, many uh, activities are not recognized and reported as non-market approaches. So I, I mentioned uh, things like policies and taxes and, and subsidies and so on. The, you know, they, these don't usually make it uh, or they're not presented as, as non-market approaches. Um, but the big focus, of course, on 6.2 and 6.4. And every time I come to this event every year, I have to edit the agenda to say it's Article 6. So it includes Article 6.8. And, and you, know, you know, you spoke largely about 6.2 and 6.4 in your introduction, because always this interest is in, uh, is in the carbon markets. Don't worry, I'm not going away. Uh, I'll always be raising it. And um, the last thing we need really to make more progress on this is governments to realize that they need to step up and create an enabling environment that encourages the corporates and, and consumers in the developed world to start contributing towards adaptation and not just paying for mitigation. And that's something that they could easily do. They could invite corporates to say, look, you know, you're doing a great job with your mitigation. You're spending all this money on your net zero targets, but we have a commitment to balance investment and adaptation. So let's start looking at what we can do for adaptation. Now, let's move just briefly to the adaptation benefits mechanism. Uh, and this is one opportunity to develop a non-market approach under Article 6.8. The context is that in Africa and uh, in the rest of the world as well, but particularly in Africa, we need more adaptation finance. Uh, but the main reason why we don't get adaptation finance is that adaptation projects don't give you cash flow. It's very hard to make money out of planting mangroves. And so you can't borrow money as a project developer for an adaptation project, but you can't pay it back. And as a result of that, most adaptation projects are grant projects given to the public sector uh, because uh, donors don't like giving grant money to the private sector and the public sector don't bring entrepreneurial skills. They don't bring innovation. They don't bring risk taking. So adaptation is not a very exciting and sexy space. So we created an instrument that enables and consumers and corporates and donors in the developed world, philanthropies and, uh, as well, to pay for what we call certified adaptation benefits. And that is a cash flow to adaptation project developer. We follow a project cycle very similar to the clean development mechanism and the voluntary carbon markets. It would be very familiar to you. We have methodologies. And in the slide, I mentioned that these um, adaptation benefits are not fungible. That means that they're different for different technologies. So I'm sorry, it's messy, it's complicated. Uh, you've got you know kilometers of, my, of of coastline protected. You've got hectares of climate resilient uh, agriculture. You've got households accessing potable water supplies. So you know they're they're, they're complex and, and messy, but they're defined in these approved methodologies. So there is a scientific process to agree what it is that you're going to deliver. Uh, there's a methodology behind that, uh, and you find a buyer who's uh, happy to, to pay for that. And then 
uh, when the buyer receives the certified adaptation benefits, the idea is that what they actually get is a code and you'll go into the interface, you'll use the code, cancel or redeem that adaptation benefit, and you get a package of information that you use to report through the enhanced transparency framework how much money you actually spent on delivering genuine adaptation benefits in the host country. And that's extremely valuable because uh, to be able to report contribution that you've made to a host country's needs, it's something that we're going to have to be uh, building capacity to do. And then I, I think my, my final point or second penultimate point is that project developers, when they get a registered project and a signed purchase agreement, this would then form collateral that would enable them to borrow money from a development bank or a local commercial bank. Of course, that's not happening yet because nobody knows what an adaptation benefit is, but it's where we were with carbon markets in the early 2000s when the prototype carbon fund kicked off and started signing purchase agreements for certified emission reductions. And surprise, surprise, that is where we are now with the adaptation benefits mechanism. We're trying to create a fund Called the African Adaptation Benefit Fund, that will do just that. We will have a call for proposals and we will sign purchase agreements for adaptation benefits and we'll try to kickstart that market and demonstrate through donor governments that there is an instrument that they can point to and encourage the private sector and consumers to start contributing towards adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Uh, so many questions, and I know you're leaving. I'm sorry, yes, I'm going to have to leave before the event's over. But I'm around for the whole two weeks, and our pavilion is just next door, the FDP pavilion. To, to leave, Gareth, what, I mean, where is the conversation day? Um, anything we should uh, look forward to this uh, this COP? Um, and then second, you know, are there any pilots? I mean, you referenced the, the fund that you've been thinking about, but are there any project pilots that you can um, that you can share with? And then what, what will it take to do that first? Off so thank you very much, uh, Hania. Those are all uh, three great questions. Let me just touch on them briefly. So I think that the big thing we're hoping for out of this COP is the creation of a database or a website for the Article 6.8 non-market approaches. And we need to get the adaptation benefits mechanism listed there. So some of our champion countries uh, that are supporting us, we hope will put their weight behind that to get it listed. And if we can get it in there, then we're in a much stronger position to go to donors and say, look, African parties are asking for this, uh, so please give us some money to help develop it. Um, we do have a, a sort of half promise of funding from the US administration. Uh, the Treasury put in the 23-24 budget, they put money in for, specifically it says on page 808, to anchor the adaptation benefits mechanism. But as you know, that budget is stuck in the uh, uh, approval process in the US government, and I don't know when it finally comes out, whether it'll still be there or not. Uh, but that's our, our big hope to actually get some money to kickstart the fund. Um, and um, where we are with pilot projects, we have two pilot projects that are underway. One is climate resilient cocoa production in Cote d'Ivoire. So that's basically an agroforestry methodology. And the second one is rapidly deployable temporary dams in a housing estate in Lagos to help cope with flooding uh, that comes from three different di directions, depending on what the event is. Uh, and that's a, so that's very interesting. They're both developing their methodologies. The, the projects are actually ongoing already on the ground. They're kind of pilot things. We're just running in parallel. So as soon as we can get the methodologies approved, then uh, we should be able to uh, hopefully this time next year, perhaps actually have some certified adaptation benefits to show what they are like. Uh, we have a methodology panel. Um, Axel Mikolova and Dauda Ndai from Islamic Development Bank are the, uh, the two co-chairs for that. Uh, we have an executive committee and so on doing all their work, and we'll have some more events around here. Uh, and um, uh, I think the uh, sort of the last thing that we're trying to do is really fundraise for the uh, African Adaptation Benefit Fund, uh, and uh, we're hoping to work with our partner MDVs. I think they're all waiting to see what progress we make before they they jump on board. But I'm I'm confident we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, it's just taking a long time, partly because of the I think the big interest in uh, in mitigation uh, and the six two six four. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks. So this is a vision to create an adaptation market. Uh, it is not a market. It's some... not a market because it's not market. It's a non market an, an, an because they're not an non an adaptation market. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Jan Willem. Yeah. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, always hard to speak after Jan. Um, so no, but uh, Gareth, uh, I see this as a, a, a three-step uh, three model, which is. We get more carbon markets, higher prices, a higher share of proceed, and then we can channel it through mm -hmm. the IBM. 
yeah, through, uh, through resilience. Except so, the share of proceeds is 5% or 2%, yeah, yeah, yeah. whereas it should be 50%. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's too much. Yeah. <laughs> So no, the ABM is in the, well, from the EBRD point of view, it would be a market mechanism, uh, classified as a non-market mechanism for the purpose of C Article 6.8, because we are a market transition bank. Um, so uh, let's say maybe uh, my slides can go up. If I can't, there's no ice in no, the back of the uh, you, you tell me. So, um, yeah, if, uh, EBRD as I said, is a market transition bank. Uh, we very much promote markets uh, and carbon markets in uh, in our region. Um, I don't know where the slides are. It's a bit cold, isn't it? Okay, that's the opening slide. So, if I press now, yeah. So. Um, the, the graph you uh, see here is the, where we basically show that uh, the, the countries of operation the EBRD has in Eastern Europe and uh, Northern Africa are, are quite carbon intensive if you compare that to the e, EU average and, uh, and, and other regions. There has been, uh, a, if you look at the sub-regional uh, level, there have been improvements uh, that say over the, over the period. Uh, with the exception of uh, of Turkey, which uh, kind of increased its carbon intensity of the uh, of the economy, um, but all in all means that uh, where there's high carbon intensity also means that there's ample opportunity uh, to to reduce and and in a lot of cases very cost eff effectively. So we there's an enormous investment need, and uh, we did some. Uh, if we, if you would translate that purely from a mitigation side and and and, and then looking at the carbon intensities, and if there would be trading in the region, yeah, you would need some 400 million a year uh, in the coming years in order to start uh, to really decarbonize these economies. Um, so carbon pricing is going to be very important to make the difference between a a grey or a black project to a green project and and this is the reason we are promoting various carbon market instruments uh in in the region so i say next slide to myself now um there are uh, uh so we have uh an... i think you went to one too far oh i clicked too much yeah i'm now on this one um so uh, we have, uh, uh, as most of the MDBs are doing here, we uh, we do uh, policy dialogue and capacity building, uh, but also technical assistance and investments. Uh, if I translate that to our carbon market area, um, then um, let's say, and I come back to that later, but we do quite a bit of policy dialogue. This is not only kind of, um, uh, uh, providing consultancy services, but actually a dialogue with governments uh, by by ourselves, also by our senior management, in order to kind of move the dial in in the in the conversation with the countries. And and in fact, the storyline is the, the 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 more what they do on the climate uh, as to the ambition and uh, targets. Uh, the, the more finance we, in fact, can deploy in the countries, and uh, particularly now all the MDBs also have said to be uh, aligned with the Paris Agreement, uh, we need to have the right narrative uh, and the right policy embedding um, in the countries. Now, if a country says, yes, I want a carbon price, and of course various options, so we often do a, a scoping study to see whether it has to be an emissions trading scheme or a, a carbon tax or a hybrid system of a carbon tax with emissions trading. All of that is possible and it's very situational or depending on the country and, and also their desire how they want to go about it. Now, between then countries, there's of course Article 6 uh, and Corsia, that's the scheme for uh, aviation. Um, now, we have seen in the past... Uh, I'd say one year, one and a half year, an enormous interest increase 
in top of markets. And this is also because the proximity to the European Union, which now has its uh, launched its uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, and it's really now up to exporting countries to decide whether they impose a carbon price themselves and then keep these proceeds and revenues at their site or whether they uh, kind of uh, transfer that to the Brussels for further spending it by Brussels. Um, so, and that uh, phenomenon really helps to uh, accelerate the conversation um, on carbon pricing in a number of countries. Um, similar to the World Bank, we had a, a couple of carbon funds in in past and that led to a lot of interesting experience. I think on, uh, let's say, uh, how to measure carbon reductions, how to, you know, to a large extent that also informed our climate finance tracking methodologies and greenhouse gas accounting methodologies. So it also now will influence uh, going forward uh, a renewed interest in climate outcomes and, and, and results. Um, but going forward, we will uh, very much look through providing capacity building first and foremost on domestic carbon pricing, um, and then see how it can be. Um, Baba, come in. <laughs> um, uh, let's say um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so to bring the train back, so domestic uh, carbon pricing, um, but also the international uh, regulated or uh, compliance markets like uh, uh, Article Six or, or uh, let's say regional emissions trading scheme like the EU, for example, has. And then there's, of course, a, a role for the voluntary market uh, as well, although that, um, I, that's why we need to have a, a little bit more oomph on the robustness, et cetera. Welcome. welcome. Um, Come on in. And um, yeah, we are active in this uh, in a number of countries, as you can see uh, in this slide. So we are supporting Kazakhstan on its uh, emissions trading scheme. Uh, we're working in Ukraine, although uh, uh, everyone knows the situation in Ukraine, of course, at the moment. Uh, Turkey, um, we uh, we're working with them on uh, on Article Six and uh, and uh, CBAM and uh, VCM support. Um, with the European Union, we we try to leverage as much as much as possible the modernization and innovation funds. Um, and so on. So quite a bit of uh, activity, and uh, yeah, we we should uh, further uh, accelerate this because uh, the lack of a, a common carbon price is a real hindrance to the deployment of uh, uh, let's say finance at uh, at scale. Uh, it's uh, we we can all pledge to do more climate finance, but if the underlying business models are not uh, adding up. And there's very little to be financed, so that's uh, that's the whole. Uh, and carbon pricing can really ha help here. So on Kazakhstan, just a, a couple of snapshots on country support. Are we? Kazakhstan. Yeah. So um, in Kazakhstan, there's already a, a, an emissions trading scheme. We helped to set up in the very beginning. It's a bit lackluster, to be frank, um, as to carbon pricing. Uh, but um, we can say the same for other carbon pricing models that have been out there. I remember that the EU ETS at the beginning uh, quickly went up to 35 euros, and then uh, there was a collapse, and then it uh, almost sank to 5 euros, which is about the same as the current carbon price in, the, in Kazakhstan. So uh, prices in market mechanisms, they go up. They, are, they should be a result of the economic uh, development, and, uh, but they're also very depending on political decisions. Um, but here we in Kazakhstan, we are helping uh, to provide advice on uh, improving the environment integrity. Um, uh, one of the big things uh, in Kazakhstan to be improved is the market liquidity. Um, but we also are working with, uh, with them on creating international opportunities uh, uh, particularly the non-ETS uh, sectors. Um, and another country up and coming is uh, Uzbekistan. Um, and we uh, have been working on the carbon pricing roadmap, as I said, uh, uh, 
countries come to us and ask, uh, okay, what should we do? Um, and uh, so there's a, a whole suite of instruments that can be deployed. And so it's really uh, in dialogue, finding out what, uh, what, what would be a good way to start off uh, in implementing the carbon price. Of course, measuring, uh, uh, let's say, keeping your house in order as to emissions is, uh, is a first step. So doing the monitoring, reporting, and verification of uh, all the uh, emitting sectors, as well as the greenhouse gas accounting around that. And then you can further design. Uh, it depends a bit also on your economic structure, whether a carbon tax would make more sense uh, or an emissions trading scheme. Uh, if you have sectors that are fully state owned and so on, then uh, the prospect of uh, doing the emissions trading scheme might be not that uh, uh, good because with whom are you trading then? So again, you need the uh, various private sector actors really then engaged in an emissions trading scheme and then you get liquidity and so on. Um, and then there's of course the interaction with Article 6 because the moment that a, a country exports a, a part of its carbon budget, then of course that carbon budget can no longer be used by its own sectors. And there's trade-offs there to be made. And uh, an advantage of doing an Article 6 uh, before is that uh, there's money for it, whereas maybe there are not enough domestic savings to create the same money value in the country. And then, with then you can use that to kickstart for example, the uptake of uh, very modern technology and uh, and grow the market. Um, we already talked too much, so the last slide is on Turkey. I know it's not the last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we, whose presentation is this? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, in that case, I wanted to talk about Turkey. Um, and I wanted to talk about cooperation with uh, the MDBs, but uh, you already did that, uh, Anya, so I'm going to pass it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 um, come, oh, yeah, yes, uh, Okay, VK, over to you. Thank you. That'll be. Yeah, we can see all the signs. Yeah. No, I'm not the only one who has. We are. This is the first event, yeah. so we're also exactly. Uh, we're, we're figuring it out uh, while we yeah. oh, we're 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 on it. Okay. So it's, it's, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, sorry. So, so yeah, sorry. while so we get the slides uh, back, yeah. back up, I, I was just speaking uh, yes. yeah. at an uh, at an event, and I was talking about voluntary carbon markets, and it's a country yes. that um, really Actually, prioritizes I... ES systems. And um, you know the the chair walked uh, walked out after the session. He was like, "Why do you talk about car voluntary carbon markets so much? You know, ETC, e ETS is the way way to go." And I'm curious because you were telling us about the Kazakhstan example and then the Uzbekistan example. How do you how do you see this? And what kinds of uh, feedback are you getting from countries about the decision between you know opting for domestic carbon pricing instruments or prioritizing you know market or monetization approaches? Um, I, I think uh, different actors or different countries are in different mindsets and um, still for example with some countries the idea that uh, that they can only sell yeah but we're living in a Paris agreement world so de facto there needs to be a carbon budget of some sorts for country so uh, you you really need to look at when you start trading into the opportunity cost and benefit. People forget the benefit um, in, in for the economy. So in making that judgment as to whether to sell or buy uh, and so on, uh, uh, 
yeah, countries would need to develop their risk uh, risk framework almost like uh, you do as normal as a trading company uh, have a have a unit in the government that basically decides uh, okay we, uh, we can bring some liquidity to the market and uh, and create a, a monetized value uh, and that can help to accelerate the economy in the right direction um, and that type of uh, more sophisticated thinking i think that it's up to us as mdbs yeah. to help to cultivate that i don't think we should go into countries and say you can sell 100 million ton uh, at this price uh, and, and almost see it as an equivalent to climate finance this is not pure plant climate finance this is a market mechanism and and people need to start acting uh, yeah. uh, like it yeah okay great thank you i think we have the slide the correct slide to pick up. okay yeah no, uh, Jan Willem said it is very difficult to speak to after uh, Gareth has spoken. So I would say there's no need for anyone to speak after Jan Willem has spoken. So this could be, you know, taking over the complete uh, landscape of the market opportunities. Fantastic. Thank you, Jan Willem. Uh, you know, it's it's a pleasure to be here with all, all colleagues from um, MDBs. It is the first family we belong to. And um, as Hanna very rightly said right at the beginning, what we are trying to do is to build momentum for the markets. We are trying to co-create the, the, the markets once again. Uh, the MDB Working Group has been working on a number of initiatives, building knowledge, building capacity, also building on the experience and expertise that we all bring on the table from the Kyoto Protocol and things like that, creating a carbon market club. So, uh, you know, we all recognize that carbon markets are not an end by itself at the end of the day. Carbon markets are a conduit to reach somewhere, and that somewhere is scaling of the investment that Anna, you very rightly mentioned right at the beginning. We, we are trying all trying to move from billions to trillions, and we are trying to see how carbon markets can provide the financial incentives for the investors to kind of overcome many of the challenges that are there out there to catalyze investment. So this is where ADB also looks, you know, we, we see that the more more than 50% of the GAG emissions come from the countries in Asia and the Pacific. And that also means there's a whole bunch of opportunities. You know, ADB has taken a huge uh, target to enhance its uh, climate finance, $100 billion, 2019 to 2030 from our own resources. But at the same time, if we need to unlock those investments, we need to explore all possibilities to help countries to, to catalyze those investments required in those advanced low carbon technologies, enhancing the climate action. And that's how we, that's our business connect with carbon markets. Uh, many of you are aware that we have been engaged with carbon markets for a long period of time. We, we were there in the Kyoto Protocol and we have always taken a two, two pronged strategy. We help countries on the capacity building and technical support side on one side, helping them on the, both upstream and downstream, creating the policy framework, institutional infrastructure, also helping them create sectoral pipelines and helping individual projects so that they can securitize carbon assets on one side. On the other side, we create carbon funds through which we mobilize carbon finance. Once again, we try to help countries to access carbon finance that can incentivize investments in low carbon technology. So this is what we have done. Uh, a little bit is an introduction that, uh, uh, you know, what we try to do is this is a, this is our carbon market program 2.0. As you can see, this is a combination of technical assistance projects and carbon funds. Uh, we mobilize carbon finance. We provide technical support to individual projects. We provide capacity building support to the governments, to different institutions. And we provide knowledge support that becomes all the more important and as we transition from Kyoto to Paris. Uh, this is uh, this is detailed information on some of the instruments that we have done. I would not like to walk you through the different information, but just to give you a little example, in the in the Kyoto regime, we established Asia Pacific Carbon uh, Carbon Fund in Kyoto Protocol first period. With seven European government participants, we bought carbon assets on their behalf. We backed it up with Future Carbon Fund and the Kyoto Protocol 2 period, which was again mobilizing carbon finance to support advanced low carbon technologies. In 2014, we established Japan Fund for Joint Crediting Mechanism. 
the only bilateral mechanism initiated by the government of Japan. The, the idea is to catalyze investments in advanced low-carbon technology. Uh, GSCM, as most of you are familiar with, is in kind of in a forerunner for Article 6.2, when countries are trying to work on how to pilot, how to get their head along. In implementing Article 6, GSCM is already there with a number of countries have signed bilateral agreements and a number of projects. Once again, majority of the projects in Asia and the Pacific. So we have a body of knowledge and capacity within Asia and the Pacific not only from the CDM terms, but also from JCM, which makes it much more easier to operationalize Article 6. Uh, so even in the, in the, in the Paris regime, we, we took the advanced charge. We established an Article 6 support facility, uh, which, which is providing both upstream and downstream support to countries. We are working with a number of countries in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, meeting the country specific requirements, but as countries are trying to, to make the strategies, there's a whole bunch of transitional confusion. Uh, first of all, there was a long, long negotiation. So countries from Asia and the Pacific had challenges in understanding different technical options. We supported that. And now can, we, we have got Article 6 rule book. There's a number of carbon market opportunities are coming up, but countries are still trying to develop their strategies, how to use uh, carbon markets as a part of their broader climate policy architecture, and that's where we are supporting countries to enhance their 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 knowledge and understanding of different options, how they should go about operationalizing their NDCs, and in that context, how to use different carbon pricing instruments and also carbon market opportunities. I think this is very important for countries in Asia and the Pacific. So. At this point in time, we are working with a number of countries to help them to develop their national strategies, to operationalize Article 6, developing national frameworks. Uh, so three broad areas of the article support that we are providing for uh, through Article 6 support facility. Number one, we are helping them to develop policy and uh, these national strategies. The second one is to help them develop their institutional infrastructure to operationalize markets. And very important in the current times is to help countries conduct Article 6 pilots. So we, we think that conducting pilots will again create a body of knowledge that will help countries to, to operationalize markets. Uh, in parallel to all this, we have been developing uh, some of the knowledge products. We have taken a bit of a thought leadership in Article 6 together with other colleagues from the MDBs. We came up with the decoding Article 6 and something that we are taking forward. Uh, we are launching a new knowledge product on national strategies for carbon markets. We realize that the countries have multiple opportunities right now to take advantage of markets. They are voluntary markets, they are compliance market, 6.2, 6.4, and then adjusted market, non-adjusted market, then we have Corsia. So I think countries are trying to wrap their head around how to take advantage of market opportunities. So this is what we are working on, providing on-site on, on support to countries, basically to work out their national strategies, uh, to understand that these different opportunities are not mutually exclusive. They need to make their own combination in their, in the, considering their national circumstances and priorities. Uh, this is some information on the Japan Fund for JCM, something that we continue to work on. We are already supporting a number of projects. And finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that we operate on a two-pronged strategy and capacity building side. So on under the Paris regime, while we establish Article 6 support facility, we have established a new carbon fund that will buy carbon assets uh, under Article 6 to mobilize carbon finance once again to catalyze investments in advanced low carbon technologies. The aim is once again to, to bring about transformations, but not only, not only to purchase carbon assets for the financing partners, but also to make sure that we contribute to the development of high integrity carbon markets. We are not just looking at the tons of CO2, but we are also paying enough attention and a price on the, the sustainable development impacts that are brought about for the local communities and beyond. So I'll stop at this point in time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, PK. So, so Vikram, you have a lot of people on, on this panel and in, in this room and in our teams that are thinking about carbon markets and Article 6 and, and unlocking finance. And you were uh, part of the, the early teams at the bank that was also thinking about these issues uh, you know, years ago. And now you're looking at climate finance more broadly. 
So very much looking forward to your presentation on uh, climate finance trends today and also about your views on, on carbon finance and, and what role does has it been playing? What role do you expect to play moving forward? Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I presume this is on and if not, uh, it's perfect. So thank you. First, apologies for being late. Uh, uh, I thought two hours was enough. Oh, it's doubly embarrassing that when your boss makes it here before you do, then uh, uh, it is what it is. So thank you for having me. Um, my name is Vikram Bridge. I am uh, the advisor for climate finance and climate policy initiative, but for full disclosure, also a recovering development banker, uh, as Hania mentioned, 25 years at uh, the International Finance Corporation, including some at the World Bank. Um, if you're not familiar with CPI, and I think just for context, and I'll go through quickly to try and make it for some time uh, lost by Miney not being here. Uh, CPI is a global analysis and advisory organization that has deep expertise in uh, finance and policy. And the idea is work with governments, financial institutions, um, businesses that to help drive economic growth, right? And all while addressing climate change. The group as such is new to carbon markets, and to be quite honest, um, there were a few of us external advisors while we were at the bank IFC, told them not to uh, get into carbon markets. But I think the whole issue of you have, you cannot avoid. I think VK said it. I'm sure Jean Willem said it earlier. It's not a panacea. Uh, but it definitely needs to be part of the toolkit. And of course, with it needs to be the whole slew of integrity issues, which is sort of why we are involved as CPI. But just for recap, uh, this is the latest um, from the new flagship, new version of the flagship report, the global landscape of climate finance. I'll take three minutes to set the stage, then I'll try and hopefully get to your MDB and carbon finance question. Um, so good news, VK, is I think we've hit trillion. So it's uh, for the first time, the average was 1.3 trillion. But uh, that's quite a jump uh, from the sort of previous two-year report. Um, and definitely compared to, it's nearly a doubling from four years ago. But the problem is that trillion is not trillions yet. And I think there is a gap of anywhere from four to six trillion, depending on whose numbers you believe. The point is no point optimizing that number. We are far, far, far from goal. Um, this is really, it used to be called the spaghetti chart. Now it's referred to as the Sankey diagram. I guess that's the more technical <laughs> term for it. Uh, basically, it walks. It's this is the recap of where that 1.3 trillion dollars essentially came from. On the left, extreme right is where it went. So effectively, the different providers of the money on the left, the different sectors where the money made it to the right, and then the intermediation. Um, in the middle, effectively. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, but, uh, uh, and this is, and by the way, since I refer to the boss, I should mention Barbara Buchner's in the audience. She is the global managing director for CPI, and she started this 10 years ago, so uh, I hope I'm doing it justice. Point is, um, a couple of quick points, uh, getting to MDB world. Um, the biggest chunk was East Asia Pacific, but if you ignore China, I mean, and of course, even bigger than uh, Western Europe and North America. But if you ignore China and if you ignore um, uh, Europe and North America, and if you just looked at LDCs and emerging markets at large, it's less than 20%. It's like 16% of global climate finance tracks, um, public and private combined, that's getting there. So uh, since we are in that world, this is clearly a gap that is going to be huge. So we'll stop here and sort of leave it in this chart while I talk through the linkage. So coming back to carbon markets then, uh, we, we all agree it's not a panacea. We all agree that it uh, needs to play a role. Uh, we can talk more about integrity. But the point is, if we are going to help our client countries or the developing countries are meaning the MDB client countries at large, you, the MDBs have a huge role to play in the context of carbon markets, but also in terms of ensuring that the money is available for 
the transition. Let's, if you take the energy sector itself, the demands on trying to get the conversion, the accelerated retirement of coal, uh, we can talk a little bit about that later, or just the exit from fossil fuels is going to take a huge amount of money. So one of the things, whatever the results-based climate finance it may be in the form of Article 6, in the form of other um, sort of monetization, voluntary markets, I think the depth of credibility, the financial policy credibility, and the depth of the strength of balance sheets that MDBs have become a huge asset to trying to help countries do something with it. And Rika, you mentioned, and there are good examples from the World Bank in the billions of the various funds that are available to pay for carbon credits. But either through direct lending, or more importantly, I think through new structures that mobilize private capital. And I'm not talking about private capital to buy the carbon credits as much as I'm talking about mobilizing private capital to fund the projects that will ultimately generate carbon credits. We know, at least at the time I was in the MDB, getting advance payments from buyers is very difficult. That's not their job. If Sweden wants to, and I pick Sweden, uh, or pick any country that is an Article 6 buyer, is going to commit to buying credits from a developing country, it'll pay on delivery. I mean, that should be their role. But the countries have to mobilize that capital. And I think the private sector can be leveraged. Um, you have to establish financial structures that could actually securitize these future flows so that they can be paid back when the revenue is there. You have to help address the risks in the market. One of the biggest issues is the delivery risk to the carbon buyer, because if that credits don't get delivered, they don't get paid. If they don't get paid, the private sector doesn't get paid back. Oh, our friend Yasser is here. MEGA, for example. I mean, at IFC, we did a delivery guarantee at a project level. I think you need an asset, you need a product that can do that at the sovereign level, because you are going to have to be risk for the lenders, which hopefully are beyond the MDBs, these flows. Um, and of course, I think somebody, I think VK mentioned, and earlier may have been talked about the Miss Garrett's presentation, but the whole issue of creating pricing um, consistency in the market, either through callers or some structure that assures a certain level of flow price uh, that is both substantial uh, as well as available to be securitized. Yes, we can leave upside for the private sector that wants to help trade or uh, governments that want to tap into markets later. But there are these, I think there are these three things I would say that the MDBs can do. In addition, of course, to all the technical assistance and capacity building that they're doing to get these countries ready for Art 6, but let's not lose sight that Article 6 is a means to, an, or any carbon market ultimately is a means to an end, and that is to hopefully affect the, particularly the just version or the energy transition, including the just version of it. I'll stop here and uh, sorry if I rushed through some of that, but um, happy to uh, engage in discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Vikram. Maybe a, a quick follow-up question. Of uh, this chart here, does any, is any of this results-based climate finance? Um, no, I don't think we track that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's why it's sense. very small in any case. It's, it's, in any case, it's very small. Yeah. But um, you know, look, the voluntary carbon markets themselves are what $2 billion right now. That's doubled since uh, there. It wouldn't even be a angel hair passed on that chart, uh, so to speak. But uh, you have a intervention. Your mic's on. No? You have a mic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That, uh, I, I, I just to add, uh, okay, the. the the, the the voluntary carbon market let, let's assume it's two billion uh, if if you look at the grant equivalents of of the climate finance that is out there which uh, as you know is mainly concessional zero interest type of uh, loans uh, then the, the VCM is almost as big as the global climate funds yeah from a grant equivalent perspective. Yeah, from a grant equivalent I, because it's a real transfer of so, funds to, to I think to Hania's point, this was more. This is everything. This is commercial. This is concessional. This is MDB money. This is public, private, domestic flows. 
everything that's tagged as client finance. So yeah. I don't think we have a version that does the grant equivalent of mm. all of that because a lot of it is commercial. So the grant equivalent of the commercial would be zero. The point though, while that comparison is valid, Jan Willem, I'll take, uh, I just sort of counter that by saying at the end of the day, it's the money flows that matter. And in, if we are going to sort of scale up, then uh, the yeah. grant, the carbon markets are effectively a promise to do something for pay for something in the future. Question is, how do you bridge to that future? That was the point yeah. I was trying to make. But yeah. point well taken on the yeah. Ulins. So I want to leave a few minutes for, for Q&A, but, but Hari, I want to bring you in just to build on uh, Vikram, your point around mitigating some of the risks uh, of carbon carbon markets. So um, Hari, and, and we'll take advantage of, of Yasser uh, being, being here and ask you to jump in as well. But can you tell us about some of the thinking that we're doing around uh, g- mitigating some of the risks in carbon markets? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hania. I think, yeah, as uh, good to know that as in the room. So um, the, one of the biggest risks, I think, uh, especially um, in the Article 6 markets that we're all aware is the, uh, the issue related to the corresponding adjustment. And uh, I'm sure there will be a huge debate uh, when during the COP about uh, about the revocation of those authorizations and the implications it will have on the market. Um, I think this is one of the major uh, risks, I think, to the the, the, the buyers in the market will face uh, in the context of where countries are still struggling to establish you know, necessary policy frameworks and then clear guidance um, on when to authorize and not to authorize and what the implications it will. In that context, of course, I think there are some uh, encouraging examples recently. Of course, three countries started authorizing and then Rwanda, first country authorizing the private sector-led uh, you know, transaction for doing corresponding adjustment. But this is going to be the huge issue for it. I think uh, what MIGA is trying to do right now, building on the experience uh, um, they during the CDM days, uh, uh, I think they are exploring the role we can, what role actually can it play in the next generation of carbon markets. Um, it's because the because the Paris Agreement is a bottom of framework, especially, and it gives great flexibility for innovative approaches. Uh, but at the same time, it also you now brings risks and uh, and then of course for RAS, it, it also offers an opportunity to to strengthen the no, no complementary of you no know, relevant guarantee products to encourage you know, broader participation. Um, so the use of, for example, MEGA's political risk insurance products, uh, I think that could help build confidence among market actors. Um, so in case of compliance markets in the Article 6, uh, you know, the, the use of MEGA guarantees could help you know, raise accounting adjustments to ensure that you know, there's no double counting of credits. Uh, a uh, final point is, of course, key benefits of uh, MIGA's products uh, is you know, to reduce the likelihood of these uh, risk events transferring through you know, strong dialogue with the clients and risk mitigation measures. Um, so in this context, uh, uh, I would also emphasize that the government engage is very essential and for developing any such, you know, um, um, such you know, major, major risk mitigation measures uh, so that they will be credible and transparent carbon markets globally. Uh, we are, of course, working closely uh, the World Bank Group with Omega in order to come up with you know these uh, these instruments and these mitigation measures that uh, hopefully you know many countries and then buyers could utilize in the in the future. So I don't know if Asar has anything to you know, add further and clarify anything for the industry. Thanks. Thank you, and I, and and thanks for Grim uh, and Anya. So I think you've captured it. I think Mega as a political risk insurance. One of the things that we are looking at is how can we uh, bridge the risk between the buyers and the sellers and make sure that uh, if the sellers have concerns around these issues, what can we do? So we have worked on uh, a term sheet uh, with the private sector and the public sector to see how our breach of contract cover can be extended to letters of authorization and what is needed for that regard so that we can cover these uh, as part of our guarantees. So this is something that we are working on along with our colleagues in the bank. And I think we are hoping that by next COP, we would have something that we could deliver and and, and showcase. Yeah. So this is really mitigating the risk of a letter of authorization not yeah. being issued. Um, or, or, which... being, or being honored. Right? Being honored. Yes. But my only request would be you need to push that. 
you know, that's the political risk part. But there is a financial risk associated with it also, where the performance risk, let me put it that way, not a financial right? Whether the country will actually deliver the yeah. credit. And I think this is the risk that's a much harder one to price and to mitigate, but this is actually the risk that will allow you to mobilize this ex ante exactly. flow. But this is where what I was thinking as you were as you were speaking about, you know, I always it gives me pause when people talk about carbon markets being what's going to mobilize private sector. It gives me pause because I think what's going to mobilize private sector is everything that we all do in our business, you know, the budget support, the enabling environment, you know, carbon Carbon markets, you know, maybe a cherry on top, but I don't know that that's what's gonna, what's really going to trigger these massive flows. And it's for this reason, which is, I don't think, I mean, Mega ain't gonna take the delivery risk on, you know, some of our large energy access programs. For instance, right now we have a fifteen billion dollar program with a substantial tranche. I don't know that that Mega or any other insurance um, firm would would mitigate that. So that's that's I think. A harder nut to crack. Yeah, agreed. Uh, but if I can, I yeah. respond to that a minute. If you look at large programs, right? I mean, I'm not. not let's not just say the World Bank's energy sector program, but there are these. Uh, there's the ETA. There are all these other big. That's the energy transition accelerator, for example. There are these and building on the jet P's that are already there. These are country level programs. Countries are committing to this, right? If a country commits to decarbonize its um, energy sector mm -hmm. in exchange for pre-committed offtake at scales, and we are talking hundreds of billions here, right? I mean, we are talking about uh, in the next 10 years, on average, um, large countries like Indonesia, South Africa, all of them depend, again, it's like perhaps three, two, three, four hundred million tons each at a reasonable price. That's a lot of money. Uh, they are going to do that. So there are a couple of different ways of trying to get around it, I think, and I'm just leaving it as food for thought. One is, if the country is committed, can that somehow be translated into a meager type cover on commitment or non-payment? Can it be? And we get, no obligation, exactly. And it's a... So now it's a investment, of, it's an obligation to deliver. And so there's an indirect way of perhaps uh, getting to that, right? Uh, the other thing I think is, and uh, this may not, uh, that helps in taking it off balance sheet for countries, but there's also the possibility of perhaps creating a rolling program of transition bonds where the country issues bonds that are paid back from revenues in carbon markets in the future. We did it at IFC as a forest bond where only the coupon was payable by forestry credit, but nothing stops you from paying the principal back with carbon credits too. Now it once again becomes a sovereign obligation uh, to repay the investors. So there are, I know it's a little sort of convoluted, but you're absolutely right. Swiss re I mean, the insurer, the big insurers and reinsurers are not going to go into the act. And that's why I think I bring it to this panel yeah. as a potential MDB solution. And this is very much the approach that we're taking at the bank. And, and you'll, you'll hear, you know, you'll hear my bosses <laughs> talk more about it over the next couple of days around jurisdictional approaches and really looking at our portfolio, identifying the pipeline of, of some of the larger engagements, whether energy transition, energy access, land-based uses, and and building on the, the track record with the forestry, the, the FCPF, the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, where we developed a jurisdictional approach and a standard for for for, for the coral um, approaches. And I think that's where you get the scale. That's where you could potentially get these types of buyer clubs to give commitments. With our energy access program, we're talking to, ACE, to ACME, um, with our Africa East uh, program, with ETA as well. So that's a little bit the angle that we're, we're we're taking is to be selective, not to say we want to do it all, but to look at um, a handful of of large scale pro projects to try to get that um, that buyer um, appetite to to come in, and then we'll try to get Mega to structure uh, delivery uh, delivery risk instruments. Basically, two modalities here. Uh, 
So there's one model where Yasa is underwriting a carbon transaction uh, of some sort with some political risk. Of course, the MDBs can be uh, counterparts in between mm -hmm. these transactions uh, themselves, and uh, we kind of self assured uh, in short uh, in in this regard because if if, if a country makes a, a commitment, then uh, that will be treated under uh, under the legal regime. So I think the then the private sector leveraging is more okay. That value will come to the country and it needs finance, and, and you have all these projects in the agricultural sphere or in the energy mm -hmm. sphere that needs private sector financing. Mm -hmm. But that will then flow because hard currency comes in. Uh, and also the, the the terms of the finance are are, are more attractive than for the private sector. Uh, so I think that that will be part of an interim phase until you kind of get a new norm and establish you know, on this type of transfers and and there's no repealing of contracts, uh, uh, et cetera. And at the moment that that happened, but that, that we're talking about 10 years or so for, for risk committees in the private sector to accept that. Uh, yeah, yeah, as a credit risk, or even longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. There is there is one modality that we have, you know, at ADB we have we have implemented very successfully, and that is much appreciated, is to enter into long time long term purchase agreement on a fixed price, mm -hmm. and also having the possibility to provide upfront finance. That because carbon mechanics carbon market mechanisms usually are performance based mechanisms and again it depends on a number of things including the price so the all the transformational change that we want to catalyze is very difficult if the project investors are not sure what kind of or what is the volume of carbon asset they will get and what the price they will be able to get and therefore what volume of carbon finance they'll be able to mobilize so in that sense if there is something mdbs can can really implement and we have you know kind of Right, that for our previous carbon funds, and this is what we are going to with our new carbon fund as well, is to enter into long-term contracts, purchasing a volume of con credits that are very safe to purchase, which is not going to put the the selling countries under undue pressure. Also, maintaining the integrity of the market, but at the same time providing a fixed price, so that they the the project investors are assured of the volume of carbon finance they'll be able to get, and if that carbon finance can be provided to them up front, they can use that money to overcome some of the, the CapEx challenges that they have. That's the time where, you know, the carbon finance can move away from the cash flow mechanism that we usually have, and they can that can be used as an investment element and reduce the, the capital investments required by the project investor. So this is something that can be kind of scaled up of course, that would require that some of the buying countries are able to put their money. But I think in the current context, when all the buying countries would also have NDC targets and a reasonably good idea of what their volumes they would require and what their cost of compliance would be. So I think some pricing mechanism can be worked around. So this is one element. I see you holding the no, mic no. very closely. No. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Feedback, yeah. Thank you. My name is Anna Krzyżanowska. I work for the European Commission. I'm an advisor for access to finance for innovation. Um, well, obviously, um, innovation brings an additional element of uh, complexity into what uh, is already a very complex environment you're trying to work with. So my question is, we've been... Um, talking about mostly, correct if I'm wrong, but uh, mostly publicly underpinned or supported mechanisms um, enabled by donor funds, uh, very often by, uh, by public money. Um, in Glasgow, in Great Fanfare, we've announced First Movers Coalition. I wanted to ask, how do you see uh, the mobilization of industry, not only for um, buying corporate credits, but also buying products and services and solutions of sustainable nature uh, in the countries and thus supporting the tasks that you have. Yeah, 
maybe uh, I start that. I I think uh, you already see this phenomenon uh, in your uh, with uh, your uh, hydrogen bank, um, and so, um, the, the concept there is to create a market to uh, contract for differences. Um, so you could imagine a situation where a contract for difference price is under underwritten by an Article Six uh, transaction as a as a funding uh, mechanism. So that 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 could be uh, a way to link uh, link that up. Uh, of course, it would be good if the full contract for differences from the European Union would also open up to third countries. Uh, it's in the working um, because uh, you know that uh, the marginal cost for hydrogen, green hydrogen production in the neighborhood are, uh, are quite attractive uh, as well, but still need compared to natural gas uh, quite a quite a big margin to uh, to to reduce. Mm. Yeah, but it, it, yeah. So this type of mechanisms to trigger. So I. Innovation is a, you need many, many things for innovation to work and, and, and markets to pick up, but creating, try, and that's what I also, I think what you were trying to say uh, on the jurisdictional approaches, it's really about creating the market conditions at the, at the scale yeah. that it is becoming interesting for industry to come in, right? and to, to invest in their, uh, in the trade arm in the country, the servicing, the all of that is costing money. They they will not come in as a, if it is a very small market in the beginning. So if you can build a prospect of a couple of billion to be made, then uh, industry will start to invest. Yeah. And maybe just one one point to to add, but maybe focusing on 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 carbon. I think you're absolutely right that a lot of the carbon funds business to date has been um has been primed by by donor funding i mean it's the donor funds that are giving this floor price that gives certainty to projects that 10 to 20 percent of the carbon will actually be paid for and i think here the interesting question is can we you know envision a scenario where you have the private sector providing that capitalization and i think the answer is i hope the answer is yes and i hope we're heading in that direction I think on the ITSMO side, there is potential on 6.2. And on the voluntary side, I mean, I think, you know, corporates, at least the corporates that we've been talking to, I mean, they're craving certainty. And, you know, VCMI just came out with its scope three, I forget the, it has a long name, but something around 50% of their scope three emissions can be um, mitigated via offsets. And I think that could that's something there. Then you can have a conversation with, you know, corporations that actually want to buy carbon credits to offset scope three. Now, at what price? We probably, oh, who knows? But, you know, big question how much uh, such credits can, can fetch. But I think more certainty around youth claims could really help us mobilize private capital towards carbon. And I think there are good developments, still ways to go, but good developments on supply and demand side and integrity that can potentially get us there. And, you know, maybe speaking of actual concrete projects in our portfolio, maybe, you know, testing these concepts and actual projects we're working on is, is, is one, you know, one, one idea that we can you know, think about in the Climate Market Club and the and the Carbon Action Forum is you know piloting approaches because these are big big problems to to fix. And I think um, you know our our approach, including through structuring capital markets instruments like the Vietnam Carbon Linked Bond that the bank uh, issued uh, in in February, it was really about I mean, let's start small, let's pilot, and then and then scale. With that. I think we're right on time. Thank you very much.